Thank you for joining us here at the Pentecostals for this week's message. Our desire is to make a difference by loving God, creating community, growing in truth, and serving our world. If God has blessed you through this ministry, we want to encourage you to share it with someone and even consider partnering with us to help POR continue delivering God's Word all around the world. Check out our website, porva.org, to discover more about us and our ministries. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed today's message. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. Our guests, we welcome you. We're so glad to have you in church with us today. Home folk, if you've been on vacation, we're glad to have you back. Before our youth are dismissed, I want to show you Youth Congress, where they just come from. Some 34,000 young people were at this conference. Amen. Brother David, sister Rachel, and the team got back with our youth group about 11.30 last night, and we love them. Give them a great big hand. Would you do that? We're going to hear from them tonight, part of the service, and uh, we're looking so forward to that. Praise God. Thank the Lord for what he's doing. It's been a great week. Last Sunday was a tremendous time. Monday night prayer, Wednesday, uh, our prophecy series um, that we've been teaching. God is helping us, showing us where we are in, and uh, looking at prophecy. Very powerful. Let's go to the word of the Lord today. Again, we're glad to have you in church. Nobody's told you the day they love you. I want to tell you I love you. James, the first chapter, and uh, we're reading just a few verses today. Let's read 2 through maybe 12. James 1 and 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any man, any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For well, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let the brother of the low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Starting a, uh, a series that we're going to pick up down the road, but this is going to be the first part of it. We are blessed to have the marshals with us this coming uh, Wednesday and Sunday, and then the following Wednesday. But this uh, message will be titled, The Keys to Unlocking Your Faith. And I believe there are absolute keys that unlock faith. And I want to talk to you about that today. Can we pray? Lord, I thank you that you're here in a mighty way. We, we have rejoiced as we sang about you and we felt your presence. Speak to us through your word. God, you sent your word and healed them. You Talk to us about the importance of the word. It's the light. It's the lamp to our path. Speak to us clearly today in Jesus' name and everybody said amen. amen. Turn around and shake a couple people's hand as you're being seated and tell them how glad you are to see them in church today. Would you do that? God bless you. From about 1963 to... Somewhere around 1997, you were listening to any type uh, television, radio, any program, right in the middle of that program, you could hear, and sometimes we still hear uh, the announcement, the station says, uh, we're going to test the emergency broadcasting system, and we would hear annoying sounds that we wish that we could turn off, and many times we did turn off until we thought they were over. 
And so it was a, a test of the emergency broadcasting system that lasted maybe 35 or 40 seconds. And so this, this test, had it been an actual emergency, would have uh, give us the, the message of what, whatever the uh, national emergency was and to alert us that in, we're our, in our cars or our homes we would know about this emergency. And I wish there were warnings like that, that, that just before difficulties, just before disasters, just before problems, just, just before troubles T-bone us in our life, that, that we would know, okay, there's trouble coming. Amen. But life doesn't work that way. It just seems that we're going along doing our own thing and here comes this or here comes that. Amen. There is something significant that, that we need to understand today. That, that there is always something that we're going to face in life. If it's not us, it's those that we love. It's somebody that's close to us. And so that there is something that is a fact and that life involves tests. Tests are part of the process. Before you can uh, get out of high school, there are tests. Uh, before you uh, can go to college, you've got to pass the, uh, a test. And before you can get a college degree, you've got to pass certain tests. Before you get to medical school, you've got to take the medical college admission test. Before you can get a job, you've got to take a blood test, typically. Amen. Before you can go to law school, you, you've got to take the law school admission test. And before you get into the military, you, you, you've got to have uh, pass a physical test. And so we know that life is full of tests. I want to ask you, how many have you already passed? Some tests, if we don't pass them, we have to take them over and over until we finally pass them. Amen. And so the book of James is basically a series of tests that are uh, designed to not only show how faith works, but to prove that faith works. I hope today through the word of the Lord to convince you before this day is over that faith really does work. Amen. There's a difference between a, a true faith and a false faith. Real faith and counterfeit faith. God knows. Somebody say God knows. He knows whether our faith is fickle or our faith is real. He knows whether uh, it's working on the inside or it's not working. Sometimes we can tell whether faith is working from the outside of a person, but God looks on the heart. Amen. He knows whether we have real faith. He said, Faith is so important. He said it's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not yet seen. It is that currency of heaven that we reach out and believe God with. James begins to certain, take certain situations that actually show up in real life. He shows us how a person who has real faith would respond to those circumstances. Sometimes our countenance fails us or reveals who we really are or really what we're thinking. More often, our words reveal. <clears throat> but here is the question. <clears throat> what would your faith look like on the outside if it was real on the inside? And that probably explains why in this little short book we call the Bible that there are so many imperative verses that are telling us what to do and what not to do. Because if your faith is real, then in certain situations, you will respond in certain ways because that's exactly how faith works. I want to preach to you today something practical, something that you can use in your real life. Not some mystical, amen, revelation, but the real truth that James is wanting us to understand. Amen. James doesn't fool around. He gets straight to the point. He goes right to the most difficult and toughest test of faith, and that is troubles. Oh, we'll find out what we're made out of when we find ourselves in trouble. When trouble comes our way, then we have to reveal whether we have really got faith or whether it's not the real deal. When things go south, 
when things go sour. Anybody can claim to believe in God and trust in God and have faith in God when the sun is shining. It doesn't take a lot to, to, to uh, have faith when things are going good. When there's plenty of money in the bank. When you're as healthy as you can be. When the family is all singing the same song. When everything is good. But when you can tell whether a person has faith is when the storm comes. Amen. So we're going to learn today that how to handle trouble will reveal whether your faith is living or whether your faith is dead or whether it's genuine or whether it's counterfeit and how to get your faith back on track. Amen. Amen. Sometimes people have faith that's all talk but no real walk. They make a profession of faith but not take real possession of faith. And heavily, the trials of life have seemed to burn their faith away. But God uses trouble to test our faith and to see whether it's real or whether it's the tough faith or whether it's the superficial faith. He tells us how real faith works. When the chips are down, when things are really tough, when life is unfair, when people are unfair, when there are prejudices or, or things that people have done to hurt you to the core. And when it appears that God has gone completely missing, and when we prayed and there's no answer, when we, when we try to reach out in faith and it's like there's no response, it's something that God allows many times in our life to see what we're really made out of. Oh, there's no man that wants to be married to a woman that, that every time trouble comes, she runs out with another man. Or vice versa. And God said he's a jealous God. He wants to know what you're really made out of love. He wants to know if you're going to stand when the test comes. Here's how faith, here's how faith works in times of trouble. If our faith is real, troubles will. Are you ready? Strengthen our faith. Troubles will strengthen our faith. The first half of the verse, too, is, is it takes us a little while because it, it gets, honestly, it sounds impossible. Now, we could bounce back and say it, well, with God, all things are possible. We know that. Somebody say, I know that. But when it comes to faith, sometimes it's not the easiest thing in the world. He says, James 1 and 2, this is what I'm talking about. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. Now, who in the world, in their right mind, could think it's joy when you have troubles? When I'm through with this, I hope and I believe that you'll understand what he is saying here. The situation is not if we have trouble. The situation is when, somebody say when, when. you may be sitting right by trouble. <laughs> I don't know if they're here or not. I, I don't believe in palm reading. I, 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 I don't believe in tarot cards, all that stuff. I don't believe it. But I'm going to tell you, I can read your mail today. You're going to face some trouble in your life. Yes. Just as weeds grow in the gardens and thorns grow on rows as troubles grow in the flower beds of life. And this is true of everybody. Whether you love God or you don't love God, the Bible says it does rain on the just and the unjust, but there's something about the child of God that he wants you to understand, amen, that he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will go with you even to the end of this world. <laughs> troubles are simply unavoidable. They're also unpredictable. The NIV says that we face trials, for a better translation would be to fall into trials, because that's what the word literally means, we fall into trials, amen. It refers to a person who accidentally slips or falls. We know that it usually, that's how trouble comes our way. We, we slip or fall, we get up one day and the next day there's a phone call or there's something that's going on. 
Nobody gets up in the, in the morning and say, hey, I can't wait today because I know trouble's facing me at work. I know I'm going to have an accident today in my car. I can't wait. No. It's not that we go looking for trouble. <laughs> trouble, trouble comes looking for us. Yes, yes. I'll never forget 10 weeks ago. 10 weeks ago, it was about 10 and a half weeks ago that trouble found me. More pain than I could even imagine. I was literally climbing, literally climbing the walls. Amen. Had to have surgery. I didn't get up looking for trouble. There's no pill. They ever, the strongest thing they could give me, it did not stop the pain. There's some days that we don't know what we're going to face that day, but he knows what we're facing. And he said, I will not allow more to be put on you than you can bear. And so James says these troubles will be many kinds. You may not have what I have, and I may not have what you have, but there's something very common, and that is that we'll face trials and troubles. The word means literally multicolored. Troubles come in all shapes, all sizes, and all colors. It can be from cancer to bankruptcy. It can be from unemployment to divorce. It can be physical problems. It can be financial trouble. It can be marital trouble. It can be trouble with the kids. It can be psychological trouble. It can be spiritual trouble. We could just spend a lot of time talking about the troubles that we could face. The, the, the complicated part is uh, uh, James is saying is when those troubles come into our lives, we ought to consider them pure joy. I got to tell you, when, when I was dancing with this, the pain that was in this arm that was because of my back, and, and, and I wasn't saying, oh, thank you, Jesus, for this pain. Neither did you. With your challenge. We have to admit that James is, is a little strange or he knows something that I need to desperately know. He knows something that you and I must, must search out the scriptures and, and understand. And I hope to have bring that revelation to you today why he could say that. There are a lot of things that you and I never know or never understand about a trial or a trouble that comes our way. There's one thing that we can know, James 1 and 3, the NIV says, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. The word test, everybody say test. Yes. I don't like test. Is a word that refers to a young bird that would test its wings. It means to prove whether or not something is real or whether something works. We learn the most important lesson of the day. Trials and troubles test the toughness of our faith. What are you really made out of? You may not know where trials are going to take place. You may not know what troubles are coming from in your life. But we are certain that we're not going to know, amen, that they, we know this, that they cannot destroy us. They cannot take us down if we will understand the faith factor. We can know the what of those troubles and trials. And every trial and every trouble and every test is made up of two questions. Two questions. You need to remember that God is asking you these two questions every time you are T-boned by trouble. Number one, do you trust me or not? Do you trust me or not? And then number two is how much do you trust me? You see, when it comes time to decide on what we're going to do, we need to make up our mind. I have made a decision. I am going to trust God. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job was qualified. You see, I struggle to take advice from someone that hasn't been there. Job had been there, was a wealthy man, but in just a few moments' time, he lost all of his wealth. He lost all of his family. He lost his health. He lost everything. But in his weakest time, 
in his greatest despair, in his greatest grief, he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. There's another benefit of perseverance. James 1 and 4, the NIV, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, if you're a parent, you'll get this. There's something about that little baby that nothing, no words can describe your love and how you want to protect and how, honestly, honestly, with us, we, we wanted to keep them small until we had another thought. I don't want to be small. I, I want them to mature. I want them, I don't want them to be, you know, six foot two and be in the third grade. You understand? There's something about maturing. And, and, and so one of the goals that we must have for our children is that, is that they mature. And as much as we love them and we, we want them to remain children the rest of their lives, we, we look at the big picture. And God has a goal for us also to mature. Could it be that we are spiritual Christians that are still, we've been in this thing 15 years and we're still in the third grade. And God is saying you've got to pass some tests. There's some tests that you've got to pass to continue to go forward with me. God is in the faith growing business. Would you say that with me? God is in the faith growing business. Every trial, trouble, tribulation that comes into your life is a test. What are we going to do? Here come a trial. Here comes something that makes no sense. Here comes something that's not fair. Life is not fair. We need to accept that. So who are we going to blame? What are we going to do? Good times don't test our faith. We need to get that straight. Because someone is smiling and jumping and and uh, uh, enthusiastic and they got a smile as big as you can believe and, and they live like that. That's not the real test. The test is when the rug is yanked out from under them. The test is when they get a bad uh, doctor's report. Amen. Or when things are not well. Good days don't drive us to God. Good days, if we're not careful, take us away from God. But it's the bad times when your faith grows the most. It's the bad times when, when we have to reach in and somehow get a hold of God. We've got to get a word from the Lord. Faith, faith grows the most in times when it's the most difficult times to exercise it. If you would just come and give me a word of encouragement. If you are just speak into my life. If you just come and tell me it's going to be okay. There's times that we stand on an island all by ourselves. And it's like God doesn't even care. Faith is like a muscle. Anybody working out still? You started the first of the year. I know it lasted three and a half weeks, but amen. Amen. Faith is like a muscle. You work, I got you then. You work that muscle. You work those muscles. Amen. And, and it begins to, begins to work. Faith is like a muscle. Amen. In order for it to grow, it has to be stressed. Stressed. And then it has to be stretched. And then it has to be strengthened. Stressed. Stretched. And strengthened. Oh, we get to the stress part. Sometimes we live with the stress part. Amen. So many times we want to avoid trials. We want to escape trials. And when actually it's the trials that we sometimes need the most. I read a story about a young boy that had discovered a cocoon in a tree. And as he was watching that cocoon over several days, he saw what he had been waiting for. Inside of that flimsy shell was a newly formed butterfly. But this, this thing was trying to get out and it was struggling. And so the boy, thinking that he was going to do the butterfly a favor, he took out his pocket knife and he cut a hole in the cocoon and the butterfly Better fail, butterfinger, butterfly, <laughs> amen, amen, fell out, but he, but he didn't fly. 
He didn't fly. The boy thought he was helping him because he helped break him free of that that was confining him. But the, but the butterfly couldn't fly. What the boy didn't know was that the struggle to escape was designed to strengthen this butterfly, this muscle system, so that when he did come out, he could fly. It was building strength in those, in those wings. It was something that, that was hurting, uh, hurting him, it seemed, and, and it was difficult, but that was building strength. And when he got out, he would know how to fly. God wants you to be able to fly in the obstacle of time and the obstacles of life but those trials somehow build a foundation in our lives that allow us to fly I will tell you the, the book that my wife wrote some mountains are to climb we could begin to talk about the storms the storms that come into our life at different seasons of our life and I will tell you it was like God was a million miles away and if you love me I wouldn't let my dog go through some of the things you're letting me go through Lord but he knows what's best and I wouldn't be standing in front of you preaching the word of God to you today amen and telling you you can be an overcomer if somehow I hadn't already proved that he is faithful God knows that when we fight through difficulty, through struggle and trouble, that our faith grows and our faith matures. It's how we can tell our babies, baby, let me just tell you something. Mama was burning up with fever or you were burning up with fever. And I, man, it was too far to get to the doctor. It was too far to get to the hospital. So all I could do, I just began to pray for you and call on the name of Jesus. Your favorite fever was dangerously high, but God came through. Here's how faith works. When the troubles and the trials and the tribulations hit us broadsided, we may stagger for a moment. We may even complain for a moment. But here's what real faith says. No matter what is happening to me, God is doing something in my life Trouble had to come through God to get to me. So God knows I'm strong enough. Amen, that I am strong enough to make it through. He's going to take this bad and turn it into good. What James is saying begins to make sense. When he says, consider it pure joy, the word consider means to think ahead. It means to think through. When you realize that God is what he's doing through a trial and what he's doing through a, through a trouble, to put it in proper perspective, even though you may not feel joy and probably won't, you can at least consider it a joyful opportunity for God to do a new work in your life. I don't know where uh, what's coming out of this. I don't know how good can come out of this, but you see on the other side, so you allow this circumstance to come. You're not punishing me. It's not, amen, something that you're trying to destroy me with, but on the other side, you must have seen that I needed this faith builder. <laughs> Here's the key. If you value your comfort, this is going to hurt, so just put your seatbelts on. If you value your comfort more than you do your character, if you value your feelings more than you value your faith, then trials and troubles and tribulations will drive you away from God. Good enough, important enough to do it again. If you value your comfort more than you do your character, if you value your feelings more than you do your faith, then trials and troubles and tribulations will drive you away from God. There are many people that have got offended with God. There are many people that did not under, you ever been misunderstood? You ever been just as plain as you could be, but someone misunderstood you? There's a lot of people misunderstanding God. But God has our best interest at heart. He has never failed. His wisdom is above all man's wisdom. His ways are perfect. Many have left the Lord, left the church over many, many years. I'm talking about Christianity. I'm talking about that, that, that because of things that happen in their life they don't understand. So if you value your character and your faith 
and your walk with God more than any material or physical and then you'll be able to count troubles as joy because you know that it grows your character. No matter what I'm going through, no matter how embarrassing, no matter how painful it is, God, I trust you. I don't feel good. I don't like it when the lights are off. I don't like it when my cars broke down. I don't like it when, amen, this is going on. But I'm going to trust you. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. There's another thing that trouble does when our faith is real. Number two, it changes our focus. It changes our focus. Some kind of strange thing happens. As James is talking about how the test of troubles brings out the best of our faith. Then he begins seemingly disconnected. He starts talking about wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. James 1 and 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to him. Now what in the world does trouble, trials, and wisdom and tribulations have to do with each other? The first question we always ask, the moment something goes wrong in our life, the first question we ask the moment we get T-boned by trouble is, why is this happening to me? Why couldn't it happen to him and her? Because I've already got my list. It's about this long. Their list is only about this long. Why? Somebody say, why? Sure, we ask why. What in the world, amen, is this happening? Why? James says that is exactly why you need wisdom. He talked about trials, the tests, and tribulations, and then he talks about wisdom. You need wisdom to understand how God uses difficulties in life to test your faith and to toughen your faith. That's why you need more than just knowledge. That's why you need more than just intelligence. That's why you need more than just more book learning. You can have high IQ and not be wise. Albert Einstein without the, said, without the knowledge of God, man is just a brilliant fool. Yes. Wisdom is not just common sense. It's not just what country people call horse sense. Of course, you know what horse sense is. It's what keeps horses from betting on people. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. What you need when you're going through difficult times in your life is the ability to see life from God's point of view, view because we are so human and we look through carnal eyes and all we can see is the problem, but somehow God wants us to lift up our head. Lift up our head and see beyond the circumstance and see the God of all circumstances. Amen, amen. Wisdom is... Exactly. It's that important, uh, that irrefutable imperative of every child of God. We need wisdom. Somebody say, I need wisdom. wisdom. You'll never understand how badly you need wisdom until you grasp the truth. Wisdom comes only from God. You can't study more. You can't take more courses you, and get more wisdom. Job 28 and 20 asks the question, where then does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? The answer is found in three verses later. God understands the way to it, and he alone knows where it dwells. And when we are going through difficult times, and you ask God to give you wisdom to see what is happening from his point of view, you then realize how real faith responds. Real faith doesn't say, rescue me. Real faith says, what are you doing in my life? God, I want to pass this test. I want to go through this thing without grumbling, without murmuring, without complaining, because I know that when I come through this test, I'm going to be better than I was when I, when I started the test. You've been taking something out of me. There was pride in me. There was some foolishness in me. You allowed me to go through this test not to get bitter, but to get better. Real faith doesn't ask, where's God? 
Real faith asks, what is God doing to me? And God, what are you saying to me in this storm? Then James gives two practical examples of two type people who need wisdom and how to handle difficult circumstances. He talks about people. He talks about poverty. He talks about difficult circumstances. And, and then he talks about prosperity. James 1 and 9 NIV. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wild flower. The sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. There are two things, I believe, that are difficult to handle. One is poverty and the other is plenty. One hand, we've got this person who is going through a tremendous trouble and struggle in life, doesn't have money to buy his way out of it, and it's just a struggle to have money to do even necessary things at times. On the other hand, you've also got the, the one that's rich, but he also is going through a, a type of trouble that all the money in the world can't buy it either. Never forget the man that I bought the company from many years ago, a prince of a man, a prince of a man, a wealthy man. Never forget not long after I bought the company, he had had a severe heart attack. I went to the hospital to visit him, loved that man. My wife and I loved him and his family dearly. But I'll never forget him saying, Joe, all the money that I have in this world, I would give to have your health. I can't buy it. What he was saying is that there's a place that I've come to that money can't help me. And nothing can help me. Only God can help me. Amen. Why don't you lift your hands and thank God that he is still the one on the throne that will help you. <clears throat> James' point is... Whether you have a little or whether you have a lot, whether you're dealing with prosper prosperity or whether you're dealing with poverty, amen, you need wisdom in all of these things, amen. There are some things that nobody can fix, but oh, it's good to have somebody on your side that can take care of you at any time. <laughs> Dr. Elmo Towns, who many wrote many books, 167 books, knows much about religion. He knows much about church growth and building churches in America. And he says the biggest problem the church is facing today is our people have too much. His studies across North, South, East, and West, he is at, at the dean of the School of Religion at Liberty University. He said, our people today have too much. They're too prosperous, and when you get prosperous, you forget about your need of God. Amen, amen. Spiritually speaking, <clears throat> I'm convinced that we as a people sometimes forget God. I've said at times as I've prayed for our people, how much can you trust them with? Because at a certain point, money becomes the God, and they begin to follow the money instead of the blesser, the one that has given them the blessing. I heard about an elderly gentleman who had won a million dollars in the lottery. <clears throat> he wasn't a church member, but he'd come every now and then. He had a terrible heart condition. His family was afraid to tell him, Paul, you won a million dollars. And he thought he would die right there. So they called the pastor of the church where they went, and, and they said, will you go and tell tell?" Grandpa, that he won a million dollars in the lottery. The pastor drove up to the man's farm. This gentleman was sitting on the front porch smoking a pipe. He walked up. Pastor did sit down with him, made some small talk, and the old gentleman said, 
Preacher, why are you at my house? He wanted to know. He hadn't been there before. He said, what are you doing? <clears throat> well, the preacher said, I was just driving. I, I thought I'd stop and ask you a question. What's the question? Somebody told you they just won a million dollars in the lottery, told you that, what would you do? He said, that would be easy. Preacher, I'd give every dollar of it to the church. <laughs> the pastor died of a heart attack right there. <laughs> yes. I'll tell you the greatest investment you could ever Something that will keep producing dividends on eternity is when you give back to God, right? Bad times seem to drive us to God. They force us to come before him and say, Lord, I can't handle this. I, amen, submit myself to you. I humble myself before you and say, I don't know how to fix this. My family's in trouble. My situation is out of control. I need your help. The word of God said, the scripture says, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He said, I'll bring healing. I'll bring deliverance. I'll show up. We don't understand. There's a lot of things that we don't understand. But it won't matter when we get on the other side. There's things that we say, well, I, I've got a list. I'm going to ask the Lord. I, 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 I've, I've said the same. But I have an idea that all of that, none of that will matter when we, when we cross to the other side. We walk on the streets of gold. We get to see our Savior. Amen. So when you really believe God, even in the midst of trouble, you'll find that troubles will strengthen your faith change your focus, and thirdly, are you ready? Blesses our future. Blesses our future. Blessed is the man, James 1 and 12, the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. There is a tremendous unbelievable and almost indescribable blessing that is waiting on people that get up when they've been knocked down. People that get back up and say, I trust you, God. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. It hurts. Yes, it hurts, but I still trust you. And at the end of life, that it, those that have remained faithful and steadfast, believing and trusting God, no matter how difficult times have been and troubles have been, oh, God loves that. Because your faith is not in just man, not just in the almighty dollar, not just in the job, not just in the economy, amen, not just in Uncle Sam, but our trust is in him. God says to every one of us, no matter how deep, no matter how hard, no matter how heartbreaking the trouble might be, if we refuse to buckle under the circumstances of life, but we keep on believing God, you get our heads back up. We trust God. We obey God. We serve God. He says, in the end, you will receive the crown of life. I don't know what that crown looks like. I know he's talking to the blood bond. I know he's talking to those that have been born of the water and the spirit and the living holy lives. I know that's what he's talking about. But, but, but this crown of life, there's no earthly reward that could compare to it. Anybody who's been to school knows what it means to be tested. We've all been tested. And, and, uh, but but I'm, I've never thought about that so much that, that to, when, we, when we see that God has something that is so spectacular individually for us that it's beyond our comprehension that he has waiting on us on the other side. Yes. Trials, the adversary wants to get in them and make them look bad and make them look like that God doesn't love you and make you begin to pity yourself and begin to get depressed and, and allow all of those things to come in. The enemy will come in like a flood, but the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard if you allow him. Advancement 
comes through tests. Receive a reward in the form of a diploma in high school or a college degree. We always know that the truth is that any test that comes, there's always a time when the teacher says, put down the pencil. I know, but I can't because I'm not. Oh, yes, you put it down. Amen. The test there's a purpose for that teacher taking your paper and grading it, whether or not you pass the test. There are many tests that we have been through in life, and there are other tests that we'll face in our life. And real faith says when everything comes up wrong, when all that could be lost is lost, and everything that could go wrong has gone wrong, I still trust you, and I still love you. I will pray in the morning just like I did before this storm. I will pray, amen, in the evening just like I I did when everything was good I will still be in the house of God I'll be faithful to God I'm not going to take it out on God because faith says I'm going through something it's easy to get out of marriage just take off you through adios but there's consequences and there are many that have bailed on God because they didn't understand God. They don't know God. They don't know his ways are as high as heaven is above the earth. But he gave us a road map of who get in this book and understand that he is with us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> Pearls. Pearls are the product of pain. We have a picture of a pearl, I think. There it is product of pain. For some unknown reason, the shell of the oyster gets pierced and an alien substance, a grain of sand, slips inside. And immediately that, uh, that, that sensitive body of that oyster goes to work releasing healing fluids that otherwise would have remained dormant. And that irritant is covered and the wound is healed by a pearl. No other jewel has such fascinating history. A pearl is a healed wound and one of the most precious jewels on earth conceived by irritation, born in adversity, nursed by adjustments, no wounding, no irritation, no covering, and no pearl. Think about this. It ever occurred to you that God says at the entrance to that home that we are looking for one day, heaven, the gates are pearl. I thought there'd be more responded than that. You thought about heaven lately? The gates, there's something about that storms that we've been through, if you could only see past this time. Let me help you understand. If we live to be 127 years, that is only like one little grain of sand in all of the oceans of time. There is no thing in eternity called time. There is no end. Amen. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to get our act right with God. Today is the day to say, God, though you slay me, though things are going wrong, I'm not going to go back to drugs. I'm not going back to alcohol. I'm not going back to strip joints. I'm not going back to pornography. I'm not going back to anger. I'm not going back to being mean and evil. The people who go through those gates of pearl are people that have been wounded, bruised, battered, beaten, tried, and through adversity, but responded to every trial and every trouble in faith and saying, I'm going to get back up. I don't feel like I used to feel. I've got a lot of pain. I've got a lot of worry. A lot of things have happened in my life, but I've got faith in God that God is going to restore me. I've got faith in God. Amen. In restoration, Joel, the second chapter says, and I will restore, saith the Lord, the years that the locust, the canker worm, the palmer worm, he goes on to say, and my people will never be ashamed. 
Oh, I'm not talking just about eternity. I'm talking about on planet Earth. There's a healer in the house. There's a sustainer in the house. There's a deliverer in the house. There's a blesser in the house. He said, I'll rebuke that devourer. Music should come. There is something that is beyond our ability to comprehend. And that is God's incredible wisdom and God's awesome love for humanity. Would you stand? Is your faith real? Or are you in the process of allowing your faith to grow? Are you in the process of trying to comprehend? Maybe you have an analytical mind, and sometimes that's difficult because you have to have answers from all directions. Faith causes you to throw all of the questions aside and say, I don't understand it, and I never will, but I trust you. I trust you. Would you lift your hands to him right now and receiving the word of the Lord? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you today that even though we felt boxed in at times, we felt hopeless at times, you're sending us keys to unlock our faith. You've sent us keys through your word today to move us past doubt and fear and unbelief, to open the doors of your favor in our lives. On behalf of Pastor Joe Forbush and the Pentecostals of Richmond, thanks again for spending time with us today. God bless you.